Well, um, we're uh, today talking with um, Robert Miles about his article, uh, which was published in the Journal for the Study of the Historical Jesus. The article is entitled, The Fetish for a Subversive Jesus. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to um, make, make a very brief introduction. Uh, Robert Miles is a lecturer in New Testament and religion uh, at the University of Auckland. Um, uh, Robert has been visiting us here at the University of Kent um, for, for, for some days and we're very appreciative uh, of his willingness to let us ask him uh, various questions about his work. Um, uh, also here is um, uh, Taylor Weaver who is uh, a PhD student at the University of Kent who is uh, working on, uh, among other things, um, Paul and contemporary continental philosophy, uh, reading this in light of uh, questions of political theology, economy, um, uh, and emancipatory uh, uh, um, thought. Um, my name is Ward Blanton. I'm a reader in biblical cultures and European thought at the University of Kent. Um, and thanks for being with us uh, today, Robert. Um, if I could just start maybe by asking, um, why did you uh, write this article? And I also wondered, uh, have, having just read your um, uh, Homeless Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew again recently, um, whether the article in some sense was spurred uh, by, by, by your work on that book. Um, so in some ways it, it was spurred because I'm just, I think, generally interested in this, these kind of connections between uh, I guess political categories and Jesus research generally and New Testament studies generally. But the reason why this whole idea of subversion and the way in which subversion seems to feature as this massive uh, topic within New Testament studies, um, it happened, it was actually during this conference in New Zealand, the Aotearoa New Zealand uh, Biblical Studies Association, we have an annual conference. It's kind of a small gathering of biblical scholars in the country and um, Dean Galbraith, a uh, colleague from New Zealand, made a comment, or we made a, I can't remember who came up with it first, but we made a comment to each other sort of looking at these abstracts saying um, it seems like subversion is uh, a really big deal in New Testament studies these days, like basically everything could be subversive and it wouldn't surprise us if you saw say some of uh, Paul's comments on um, the need for women to be silent in the church or something, as if that could be read in a subversive way. Yeah. Um, and time and time again, things that seem quite unsubversive are made subversive. Mm. Um, so it was on the radar for, I guess, a couple of years before I decided to actually write this article focusing in particular on historical Jesus research. Okay. I mean, so the article comes out this month, or is it already yeah it, uh, within yeah. the next couple of weeks okay probably by the time this video is on okay yeah good I mean and 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 there it's clear that I mean you make it very clear that basically subversion is, is everywhere right so it wasn't just this conference um, uh, and and um, you know you mentioned um, the way in which uh, a lot of the uh, big names of contemporary historical critical scholarship on uh, on uh, Jesus um, uh, sort of play around in different ways with this notion of subversion. Um, you also, in your article, present the 1990s as a kind of grand entry of the theme of subversion into Jesus' research. And you, you talk there ab about uh, John Dominic Crossan's work, um, and, uh, and also you look um, in, in a focused way on, on uh, N.T. Wright's Jesus and the Victory of God. Um, and. M maybe just to, to, to say a couple of things and then see where you want to take a question, but, but you know, you make it clear that in, in regard to a sort of pseudo-subversivity or, and we'll come back to this later, but this fetish of sub subversion, um, uh, you say that we need to understand this period of historical Jesus research as part of a larger cultural pattern, mm -hmm. or maybe even a shared strategy of appropriating this notion of subversion for uh, non-subversive non activities, or at least mainstream activities. Um, and I, I wanted to just ask, you know, what is it about this period, culturally, which makes it important for a backdrop uh, as a backdrop for the way in which we understand the rise of this new subversive Jesus. Um, you know, for example, what, what are some of the larger patterns or larger or shared strategies within various cultural spheres that we're seeing also then 
uh, creeping into uh, contemporary Jesus scholarship? I'll take a step back before answering that and just say that I think um, what interests me and what kind of gets me into thinking about these things to start with is um, what is the question, answering the question, why do particular ideas or themes or whatever become popular and dominant at a particular moment in scholarship? Um, so, you know, someone might say that people have been talking about Jesus as subversive or been talking about this kind of subversive aspects of texts for some time, and that may or may not be the case. Um, but what strikes me as important is that it's at that particular moment, or within that decade, that it really takes off, and it's still with us. This way in which you know you get this almost uh, word dropping of subversion through everything, or almost everything that gets written in New Testament studies these days, and it's always seen as a good thing. That's the sort of change that. Whereas subversion might have been talked about in a negative sense before then, at that point in time it, it takes off. Um, and another point, just before I get to answering your question, is that uh, I think the reason for focusing on historical Jesus research in particular, or the way in which it makes sense or is easier to kind of map it um, in this way, is because it's more market driven than other uh, subdisciplines within New Testament studies. So historical Jesus research has massive markets and interest and readership um, outside of uh, biblical scholars, a sort of small selection of biblical scholars. And so the scholars, and this is not to say that the ideas that biblical scholars are working with are irrelevant or wrong or anything like that. Um, it's just that market forces are more obviously at play and can kind of be uh, played with a bit as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so what are some of the broader uh, cultural patterns and ideas? Be before, yeah. we, before we go there, I mean, can I just jump jump in again? I mean, it, it is very interesting. I mean, um, I mean, to put it crassly, you, you, you still can get a very wide readership with a book on Jesus, um, uh, which, which is certainly not the case for um, uh, every, say, historical or or comparative or theological topic that one could pick up from early Jewish and Christian texts, mm. um, and that's an oldie, isn't it? I mean, you know, like so, so, so uh, uh, um, uh, Ernest Renan uh, um, and and also um, uh, D. F. Strauss, you know, basically had uh, major bestsellers in the 19th century mm. uh, with with work um, on uh, the historical Jesus, and in fact, they, in some sense invented not just an, uh, the, the, the genre of um, historical work, but also in some sense the kind of cultural genre of this like famous book on Jesus. Um, I, I mean, are, are, are we seeing, are, 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 I don't know, I mean, thoughts on that? How, how does this work? Is this what's going on with uh, Reza Aslan's very interesting book on, on Jesus, which has yep. just been phenomenal as a, yep. as a, as a publishing yep. success? Continue to yeah. kind of uh, get it. Well, I think, um, so in a sense, I think that uh, Albert Schweitzer was right mm. when he saw that, in a way, what these Jesus books are doing, in addition to presenting some kind of history or attempting to present some kind of life of the history of the historical Jesus, is they are, they always inevitably have some bearing on contemporary culture. And it just so happens that it's because Jesus is so pivotal culturally, historically, and religiously to Western society that it's inevitable that any kind of book that you write, especially when it's going to this kind of mainstream mm. uh, audience, um, is tied up with contemporary ideas, even if it's an argument that's taking place in the past or is about something that's happening in the past. Mm. Um, and so I think this is clearly coming through, not just in uh, the two scholars that I look at in this article, Crossan and, and Wright, but pretty much every Jesus scholar, mm, mm. Um, and particularly those uh, going for, for, or kind of hitting that um, market in between a, a scholarly audience and a, a populist one as well. Mm. I mean, he, here you and I ha have very, very similar interest, although you have a very y unique way of approaching it, but, um, but, but this question of, of an inflation of forms of conversation, 
or, or, or terms. Mm. Um, you, you know, that actually literally a term can in some sense go through a period of inflation so that it becomes a powerful form of organization. And everybody in some sense wants to identify um, uh, her, herself with, with or through this term. Mm. Um, uh, I, I mean, you, you also have consistent um, uh, uh, fascinations in your work with the, the question of relevance and how, 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 we, how we construe uh, relevance at different points. Mm. Um, in, in, in line with that, I mean, what is it about the 1980s, 1990s, which then um, becomes obsessed with the notion of, of, of subversion? Yeah, in, in the article, like, I kind of pick up two uh, dimensions to this, which are, I think, interrelated. Um, and there's possibly a third dimension to it as well. The first is that within... Um, kind of broader humanities and academic discourse at the time, uh, starting in the 1970s into the 1980s and, and becoming kind of entrenched in the, by the time of the 1990s, is this turn to, to theory um, within English studies, humanities and so on. So uh, you get the rise of particular theories of, say, like queer theory, uh, new historicism, um, post-colonialism and so on and so forth, most of which haven't had a, a major impact, if any impact, on historical Jesus research, but they did have a massive impact on other disciplines. Uh, and these um, particular approaches were interested in, a sense, subverting some of the inherited truths of the Enlightenment in terms of the processes of thinking about Western philosophy, of thinking about truth, of thinking about texts. Um, at the same time, you've got the rise of cultural studies and theorists like Stuart Hall who are analysing texts in precisely this way of how texts might function subversively or are contained within broader cultures and frameworks and all that kind of stuff. So you've got deliberate academic work, mainstream academic work happening in other disciplines and fields which is deliberately talking about these sorts of ideas and theories and concepts. Um, and this is linked on a, broad, on a broader level, I think, to this move or shift towards postmodernism, um, which is again that kind of extension of uh, modernist following Enlightenment thought, um, where some of the received truths and wisdoms of previous generations uh, or a previous system of um, determining truth, where you know truth is seen to be more uh, socially constructed, and so on and so forth. Um, but if we think, and then if we think in terms of postmodern culture, I use the example of, say, The Simpsons, also a show that becomes incredibly popular uh, beginning in the 90s, so at exactly the same time. Um, and what's happening there, it's, it's all about, it's a parody, it's a satire of American daily life, and it's subversive. It's one of the most subversive television shows, but it's also completely contained within this broader economic system. Um, so, you know, the reason why they can make jokes about Fox, the Fox Network and Rupert Murdoch and things within the very structure of the program or whatever, within the very narrative of the program, is because they make so much money for Rupert Murdoch and Fox, and they're incredibly successful at the same time as being subversive. Mm. And in a way, that's a way of subversion being contained. Okay, I mean, so, so it's very interesting as a as a model. You're encouraging us to think of, in in a way, I mean, to put it in a kind of older uh, sense of, of a dialectic here um, mm. between this odd pairing of apparent opposites, and the odd pairing, the odd um, symbiosis or kind of mutual reliance is is involved then with notions of subversion and containment. Right, so 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 let, let let's talk a little bit more about that. I mean, w w what does it look like? I mean, for example, one of the um, of the darker versions of your story involves the way in which we can look at subversion discourse as being, in a way, the um, performance as subversive, 
bad, um, transgressive, a real breakthrough or a change. Um, whereas really, um, we could read this all as a development of, of, of something that you refer to on, on several occasions as um, uh, neoliberal or neoliberalism as a cultural movement. And could you say something about what neoliberalism is for you um, uh, and, and, and why that helps us to understand the twin pairing of uh, subversion and containment? Yep. Um, so neoliberalism, which is a thread I think that comes through in my book as well, um, is this, I guess, this broader uh, political and economic context uh, where Jesus scholarship is, has been, uh, you know, produced and consumed within the past um, 30, 40 years. Um, and it has an intense focus on uh, the individual um, specifying entrepreneurial conduct everywhere. Um, pretty much every value of human life is to kind of be measured through the market. I mean, so this is the sort of uh, fundamentalist form of neoliberalism, but you kind of see the logic pervading widespread culture where there's been this sort of uh, depoliticization of um, every sphere of life so that we no longer talk about, say, class politics. We talk about um, uh, the way in which the economy is managed or, or that kind of thing. Um, so basically all it is is this aggressive restatement of capitalism. Um, and it's the ideology that kind of undergirds that. What was the second point of your, your question? How does that... It, well, I, actually, this is great. I mean, maybe we could, we could yeah, just yeah. hang there for a minute. So um, Let's link it back to the, the Jesus research stuff. So. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because I, I'm, um, I mean, because it, it, it's a very interesting suggestion. I mean, you, you, you sent, you're, you're working with the idea that um, neoliberalism is a form of depoliticization. It's a sort of desubstantializing of certain kind of pre-existing forms of the political stuff you could fight for. Yeah. Right. And so uh, you, you gave the good example just then of, uh, of, of. Um, Sort of trying to use some of the old names, say, say as the, as the academic, as the, you, you know, or or as the, the 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 worker in the factory, or or whatever it might be, and then it comes back to you as a sort of desubstantialized thing. Oh well, I I hear you, I would respond, but I'm not doing this. It's it's the same market, which is and this, within yeah. this subver within neoliberal ideology, subversion becomes displaced. It becomes uh, this kind of gesture of um, I'm going to be subversive by not buying this brand of spaghetti because they don't treat their workers right. Yeah. You know, right, yeah. so it, it, the answers to uh, political and economic situations or problems or what have you are conceptualized through already this market logic. Yeah. And it's impossible to think outside of that. Yeah. Um, and so that's a form of containment of subversion. Yeah, and then the question becomes: Is that really subversive? Yeah. Um, and so, and the reason why I'd be interested in this is because I'm interested in the way in which these political categories are operating, and I'm interested in: Is there a way of being subversive, or you know, is Jesus subversive, um, or what does it mean to say that Jesus is subversive? Mm -hmm. What systems of, of power and so on is that upholding? And mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's really nice that you you um, you associate your notion of a merely gestural subversion, which is a, a way a subversive uh, act, which is in somehow it is somehow like, emptied of its capacity to be a real challenge to actually change the political system. Yeah, yep. and so it's precisely the emptiness that which then returns as this act. I mean, um, mm. and, and you associate that with uh, Marx's notion of uh, of a fetish. Which is this? How this part stands in for this emptied-out whole, or I, I mean, later the way I, I'm intrigued also in relation to your work, um, and and I, I won't. I, I promise not to get into it too much, but I I, I thought about it a lot while I was reading it. Um, was the um, associations we could make between your notions of an emptied or merely gestural subversion to uh, earlier notions of the fetish in uh, people like Guy Debord and, the, um, uh, and, and notions of the spectacle. Mm. So precisely as there's, uh, Debord and, 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 his, and his pals were sort of uh, so interested in the way that you could look at precisely this odd dialectic between the emptying out of the political realm, 
making it weaker and weaker and weaker, so more and more ins uh, insubstantial, mm. with then the return of politics in a way as a spectacle, right, as a mere image of something. And in a sense, I mean, and to return to the Jesus stuff, I mean, one of the things that we're looking at is potentially a broad study, or, or at least you're inviting us to look at a broad sweep of historical Jesus scholarship as in a very large way, as a cultural sphere, enacting this sense of political possibilities mm. and then they're returning now in this sort of fetishized Im image of Jesus the subversive. So if we give some um, kind of direct examples of this which I do in the article um, uh, so one of the case studies into Wright's book he he really wants a subversive Jesus he uses the word subversive affixed to Jesus multiple times through the book um, but what's interesting uh, for me is the way in which subversion always appears. It's always qualified <coughs> by particular adjectives. Um, so he'll call his Jesus doubly subversive, multiply subversive, thoroughly subversive. And he'll often give explanations of why he thinks that Jesus is doubly subversive. Um, so, I mean, a good example of this is where he says that because Jesus is uh, revolutionary but not militantly revolutionary in the sense that he doesn't take up arms to actually change society that makes him not subversive but doubly subversive um, which to me is interesting because another reading of that would be that Jesus is being unsubversive or Jesus is being less subversive but no it's kind of and this is where I see the kind of fetish play out where in some sense yeah he has to be presented as even more or that rhetoric of subversion has to be heightened um, and reclaimed at an even stronger level. Uh, and what what is your sense of the consequence of not um, continuing to, in some sense, fuel the fetish, as it were, right? So if, if the notion of subversion is what's been inflated and then suddenly everybody uh, uh, um, is, is, is writing about Jesus as a subversive figure, um, what do you think is the consequence of, uh, of, of um, at the level of historical research or at the level of popular reception of allowing this to be played down, right? So, so you write historical Jesus work where Jesus is actually not subversive really or, 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 or um, not really uh, subversive. Subversive in, in quite lines. limited ways, yeah. yeah. I mean... Yeah, or, 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 or start with the question really of, um, you know, is there, I mean, what happens to the field of historical criticism if, if we, we stop talking about a subversive right. character? Okay, right. so, yeah. Because your suggestion really... Mm. Um, so the point of yeah. the article is not t for us to stop talking about Jesus being subversive. That's the wrong answer. The point is, is that historical criticism or historical Jesus research, and I guess New Testament studies more broadly, when it's using political labels, which I think it should, it should be using political categories to analyze Jesus. When it does so, it needs to be engaged with actual models and theories um, for analyzing those categories. Uh, because if it had done that, it would have avoided some of these mistakes. So it's actually a limitation of the methodology of historical Jesus research, that it's using words like subversion without ever re referring to any of these um, theorists that I mentioned before, uh, or more recent theorists who have been discussing some of these things, or even engaging with uh, historical Jesus research that does have a more nuanced view of these political categories. Right, okay. Um, I mean, and another thing that you talk about in a way that I thought was very interesting was that, you know, I mean, we, we've, we've spoken a little bit about the, um, the notion of a, of a, of a, of a sort of best-selling Jesus book. And your mm. suggestion is that we think about, you know, the, the bestseller um, and, and, and this notion that, that whatever is on, on market needs to be subversive. And we, so we've talked about that. And, and maybe we'll come back to it with this question of, of hipster as well, which you, you, you said very interesting things about. But, but in, uh, you, also, you also say that we shouldn't miss the way that it inter if we're analyzing the reception and consumption, of notions of subversion that we shouldn't hear the fascination that we are um, uh, or we shouldn't miss the fascination that we're hearing from uh, uh, 
largely evangelical groups, which are then dominating um, a, a field of consumption of historical Jesus work mm. as well. So you, you, you refer to Rebecca, Re Rebecca King's very interesting work on, 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 on um, sort of, uh, popular receptions and uh, cultural appropriations of biblical research and so on. Um, could, you, could you say more about that? I mean, mm. how, does, how does, say, uh, Crossan or Tom Wright um, relate to uh, um, desires amongst uh, contemporary evangelical groups uh, to present themselves as subversive. Mm. Um, yeah, so this and this is really quite interesting in terms of how I guess subversion plays out in the the audiences, the large audiences that read these types of books, and it plays out in ways that are quite different but quite similar. So people will, uh, or people who are familiar with the scholarship will look at uh, Crossan's work, work and look at. Uh, Tom Wright's work and see how different their Jesuses are. I mean, there are a number of similarities, but they would see qu some quite distinctive dis differences, um, and their audiences are quite different as well. So, Crossan is popular predominantly among, uh, I guess, progressive, what might label themselves as progressive Christians, um, and they, I guess, fetishize or uh, enjoy this subversive element of Jesus. Um, because it aligns quite well to, uh, and this is sort of Rebecca King's idea, um, a way of them seeing themselves as opposed to and different from the dominance of, uh, I guess, fundamentalist and evangelical voices in American forms of Christianity. So they can say, you know, look, we're not uh, homophobic, uh, or... Jesus um, is also inclusive of women, or, you know, I mean, just to take some really sort of crude examples. Um, so they're kind of being subversive or enjoying their subversion, um, and it's understood in this way. So it's not subversion against the state. It's not, they're not most uh, progressive Christians, although not all, but most progressive Christians are not radical insurrectionists intent on overthrowing the shackles of parliamentary democracy. Rather, their subversion, I guess a gestural subversion, is uh, quite truncated to this particular issue, yeah. or this particular battle. Um, on the other hand, Tom Wright's audience tends to be certain types of uh, American or American-influenced evangelical Christians. Um, and again, the subversive Jesus plays out in a way where um, they are resisting, I guess, the this imagined or constructed um, liberal secular hegemony of Western society, right? right. Yeah. So their enemy isn't so much the progressive Christians, it's more so secular society at large, um, but in the same way, and to take that crude example, uh, they can be subversive by opposing gay marriage. Um, or opposing certain cultural institutions of the mainstream liberal society, uh, liberal secular society, um, in a way that they're almost doing the same thing but to opposite effects. Uh, so both camps are, are being subversive but neither are actually attempting to overthrow the state. Right. Not that I'm championing overthrowing the state, I mean that's a discussion worth having, but um, right. Yeah. You know, it's it's or, 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 is, the, is the word subversion really appropriate here? Or any of the institutions really? Yeah. I mean, that that, yeah, that right. maybe is a way the, a, a way also of, of taking what you've done is you're suggesting that we need to think about the pleasure of mild contained subversion, right? Mm. So so contained subversion is a real is a, is a sort of exquisite pleasure that that in some sense we have to theorize so you get all these different cultural spheres so popular book consumption about religion and oh, I'm going to the religion section but maybe it's not it's going to be Dan Brown or maybe it's going to be the radical Jesus that nobody really uh, understands or maybe it's right. happening at the churches or maybe as as uh, in an academic context or someone you know that this notion of so this, yeah and this, yeah, so this is yeah. why I think that the consumption and the kind of more popular consumption of, of Jesus scholarship and I guess biblical scholarship more generally is about identity formation and this directly links to uh, capitalism. So this is where the notion of the hipster comes in. Hipsters are not just a cultural phenomenon, they're a particular manifestation of 
consumerism and kind of identity formation under capitalism. So it's a particular way of, uh, you know, it's particular fashions and preferences for particular commodities on the market that create a kind of identity. And in the same way, Jesus scholarship is, is consumed, you know. Right. Um, I like this. I like this scholar, or I like that scholar's work because it enables me to construct a particular Christian or cultural identity, which actually has uh, certain, uh, I guess, consumption imperatives um, built into it as well. And so, I mean, it's really interesting. <laughs> so, so the question is, is um, y you know, to take up this image of the hipster as this. Constantly subversive figure, but but subversive by way of, you know, as you say, you know, forms of uh, forms of consumption. Um, uh, is there then a way back? I mean, if we, if we if we've in some sense fallen into, um, I mean, I realize this is an abstract question and not not really some of the most interesting uh, stuff you're focused on, but um, but. But is there a way then back from the society to the spectacle, like living in this world where clearly in multiple cultural spheres, we, we all are experiencing the inflation of this notion of being the subversive, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a contained subversion in, in almost every case. And, um, and is, there, is, there, is there then um, a, a useful way to then think our way back into, say, good old-fashioned subversions or <laughs> contestations, really, which go beyond, say, this kind of um, this, this cult and competition of tastes or, or commodities right. and so on? Yeah. I, w I want to answer your question by actually bringing it back to historical Jesus research in particular and say that... Um, because I think, in a way, this sort of addresses the question in an underhanded way. Mm. Um, it seems to me that it, whether or not Jesus was acting subversively, or to what, it, I mean, and I think a better question is to what extent was Jesus acting subversively? Um, because it's not a kind of, he was either acting subversively or he wasn't. It's a case of, you know, how were his subversive actions contained, or that kind of thing. Um, that should be irrelevant to contemporary preferences for whether we actually want to be subversive or not, right? Like, let's make the Schweitzer move and say that whatever our historical reconstruction of Jesus, and I think that it's right to, and interesting to make historical reconstructions of Jesus, um, and we should be, if we're talking about subversion in the case of historical Jesus research again, yeah, do it properly. Yeah. But divorce it from... Um, you know, it, so if Jesus was not subversive or acting in unsubversive ways, that doesn't mean that we can't be subversive today. And I mean, by subversive, I mean overthrowing institutions or what have you. Mm -hmm. Equally, if Jesus was being subversive in completely non-contained ways, uh, that doesn't mean that we can't be subversive today if we want to be loyal and obedient to particular institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I want to. I want to ask more about that. I mean, um, <laughs> I want to ask more. But I think because I, you, yeah, 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 yeah. No, sorry. Um, How are we doing for time now? Uh, we're at thirty-three, thirty-four minutes. Yeah, I mean, may, may, maybe to, just to pick up there um, okay. f for a minute. I mean, so so I'm I'm really intrigued by the way in which uh, when you refer to uh, neoliberalism as in some sense, the, the broader dynamic which ex, ex, explains or helps us to understand this strange alliance between apparent opposites, that is, the containment story right. actually being quite docile, quite you know, useful to the institution and so on, and yet always thinking of yourself as really on the edge, right? It's endemic to all these different spheres. 
uh, you're suggesting. Um, and, and, and neoliberalism helps us to understand that. And on the one hand, you talk about uh, Wendy Brown's book on the stealth, uh, neoliberalism stealth revolution, or uh, Mark, Fish, Mark Fisher's uh, um, capitalist realism, the suggestion that you know we shouldn't underestimate the way in which everybody has just bought into. Um, I mean, we're born into it. You know, we just believe in, in certain aspects of, of the free market as, as being the things that will make everything better, and so on. So, so you have all this on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have. Schweitzer, right, and so you're you're intentionally evoking Schweitzer's condemnation of the liberal lives of Jesus um, as being uh, a, an illusion, presumably whatever he means by liberal, uh, the illusion that dominated 19th century fetishizations of a particular image of Jesus. Um, and so, uh, could could you say a little bit about that? I mean, why is it important to remember Schweitzer to be true to this uh, to this um, uh, uh, yeah, thing that I, he was? I find the the whole notion of this of the liberal lives of Jesus really intriguing, and I think it's because most, like my reading of, I went back and I read um, Schweitzer's Quest of the Historical Jesus, and my reading of it, and particularly the chapter on the liberal lives of Jesus, I think. Has, was quite different, or in some ways different, from how biblical scholars have read it and talked about it. Because they seem to think, or understand, or read liberal lives as if it's referring to uh, theological liberalism. And whether or not that was all Schweitzer had in mind, I kind of tend to take a much more wider reading of it. So um, when he's talking about yeah the liberal uh, Jesus, the liberal lives of Jesus, he's talking about the ways in which, or the it's almost the approach, and it, the approach is that they're heightening um, Jesus' uh, natural psychology, he kind of acts as this liberal individual, um, and this is, so, it, you know, Jesus is in a way becoming anachronistically a template for um, this emergence of this particular political ideology that although Schweitzer doesn't go there, it's almost implicit, goes hand in hand with the rise of capitalism. So by constructing uh, liberal individuals and making them the kind of center point of history, um, you get this universalized universalization of the bourgeois class and the interests of the bourgeois class. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, in a way, this is exactly what I see happening over the past 40 years as well, in the ne neoliberal lives of Jesus. Um, you get again this, whether they're Tom Wright or Crossan or whoever, um, they're all basically uh, approaching Jesus in a way that um, even when they're talking quite carefully and legitimately about you know, embedding him within a social context and a historical context, there are still ways in which he um, conforms to and upholds aspects of contemporary neoliberal ideology. Mm -hmm. um, a really good example of this is just this diffuse... So one of the big points of, of what's happened under neoliberal capitalism is, and it relates to the kind of hipster as a particular lifestyle or identification with capital, um, as you get this diffusion of identities as niche markets. Identities like uh, different sexual identities, different cultural identities, um, and Jesus research has kind of done this to an extent as well. Like you've got the Jesus who is uh, nice to women and um, subversive in some particular ways that appeals to particular niche markets in contemporary society and you sort of see this so each particular Jesus has its own outreach its own uh, contemporary mm -hmm. market mm -hmm. um, even if they look quite different the unifying feature of it is this neoliberal context mm -hmm. yeah so and, and, and that's the th and this is basically what Sch Schweitzer was doing as well because the Jesuses that he's talking about, or the scholars that he's referring to, are quite different and varied. They're not all arguing for the same Jesus, but the commonality is that they are making Jesus into a bourgeois individual. Yeah.
Yeah, no, I, I, I'm a big fan of this reading of, of, of Schweitzer, and, um, uh, and, and, and I've always been intrigued, I think, in a very similar way as you are with um, him as a figure and with what he means by the, um, the, the word liberal. Um, and uh, and, and I, I really make it exactly the same way, I mean, just to, um, uh, in the sense that, um, that, that for him, the break here is about a break between a measured and contained and pre-established form of freedom. And, um, and so Jesus for him becomes this image of a sort of crazy freedom. Um, uh, that's why, in a way, it comes to us as one unknown, you know, as it famously says. Um, and, uh, and, 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 um, and, and so I read all this stuff as emerging against his backdrop of a sense of the failure of modern philosophy, precisely because modern philosophy wasn't getting down to this volatile heart of, of, of freedom um, uh, in precisely the same way that we are talking about. So this notion of subversion and containment is, I think, is how he would align a, a lot of the modern uh, philosophers as well. Um, and he's looking for a way of, um, of, 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 of facing up to freedom in a way, in a more direct way. Um, so that it doesn't just say, oh, well, you know, I'm gay or straight or, you know, Latino or whatever, um, uh, and, and therefore I'm doing this, right? That's the ready-made uh, uh, identity politics form of it. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's also trying to get us to think um, about whether there is another form, a more <laughs> genuinely subversive form, but, but, but subversive in the sense that one would need to be very careful. <laughs> right. It, right, because like it's one a that would actually freedom. be dangerous. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, because yeah. this is the coming back to the <laughs> some of the things that Tom Wright says. I mean, he actually describes his, the, when he qualifies Jesus' subversion, he says, you know, it's dangerous, it's, it's revolutionary. Like, he uses these quite emotively charged terms. Yeah. So even when talking about gestural, quite diluted forms of subversion, the rhetoric is already up here. Yeah. Um, and I guess that, yeah, to me, that is really my interest, is, well, what if it actually was up there, mm -hmm. not in this weak, diluted form? Yeah. Um, what would that actually mean for, A, a reading of Jesus, B, contemporary movements, social, right. political movements? Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, may maybe if, if we could camp out a little bit on the question of uh, of um, uh, N.T. Wright, um, because he's he's such a fascinating figure for you and and for this piece. I mean, he, he's a good example of the way in which this notion of subversion then gets associated with various. You know, broadly speaking, evangelical, um, certainly Christian movements of theology, and um, and and uh, and and I've seen in various institutions, I mean, not for a long time, but but earlier when I was with, with say 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 more ecclesiastical um, or, or, or theological institutions, you know, people really experiencing the kind of slightly naughty buzz of reading Tom Wright as compared right, yeah. to their their inherited yeah. forms of dogmatics. Um, and, and, and then I've seen, you know, sometimes this stuff has had dramatic consequences in some of these institutions. And, and, and in a way, uh, Cross and, and the Jesus Seminar were doing the exact same for, uh, in the way that they were subverting other dominant inherited forms of looking at Jesus or looking at religion, right? And even scholarship. So the Jesus Seminar itself, uh, it, and I mentioned this in the article, was... Um, subversive to kind of conventional scholarly wisdom in the way that it had this uh, uh, you know voting system and th everything about it was kind of sensationalized and played into this moment and um, you know another way in which Crossan is subversive in this way is that he brings in these non-canonical sources as some of his historical material mm. and again it kind of you know yeah the, I mean I think it's not unrelated that the rise in interest and particularly popular fascination as well as scholarly fascination with non-canonical and Gnostic uh, sources is related to this kind of fetishization of subversion. There's something sort of naughty or, you know, where uh, you're being subversive in some kind of limited contained way by engaging with these materials that fall outside of the canon or fall outside of the inherited uh, 
methods, approaches, truths of whatever your social circle and group is, whether it's evangelical Christian or liberal Christian or scholar, sober scholar or whatever. Mm. Mm. Is the difference between um, a contained subversion and and, and, a, and, a, and a more radical notion of freedom a, a certain kind of fear, fear. <laughs> that's to say rather than it being just a sort of easily consumable <clears throat> and, and, and a real source of enjoyment um, that, that one, one begins to be a, 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 well, bit, a bit horrified at the, at the freedoms I, or, or the I, intensity I mean, may, of the freedoms I, that the way I tend to think about it is that this is part of the very depoliticization of uh, that's occurred under neoliberalism. So we can no longer talk about subversion in any genuine real sense of, in the frightening sense or in the, you know, mm -hmm. the actual transfer, societal transformational sense mm. because it's, it's this stunted, limited kind of, you know, our political lexicon <laughs> is now just thoroughly kind of uh, filtered through this way in which it ends up just confirming and substantiating the status quo. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I know, the, the, and the, the point really for anyone who's kind of genuinely interested in the notion of subversion and how you, you know, how subversion might actually work in the contemporary context, um, I think is to look not at, not for models of subversion, which is exactly what's happening with Jesus. It's this kind of displacement of subversion. Look for subversion in uh, the figure of Jesus or um, Mark Fisher in his Capitalist Realism book he talks about you know Hollywood films where the big evil company uh, you know gets undermined or um, you know this I mean you can see the the, the anti-empire tropes that you see in um, Jesus scholarship and New Testament scholarship over the past uh, couple of decades in Hollywood as well, in Hollywood films, you've got this anti-empire thing, like it's all about the little guy um, standing up and usually winning. Um, the way to bypass that is to look for the contradictions in the system, um, so and to emphasize them and exploit them. Um, and I think by pulling apart this way in which subversion is being stunted and misused and what have you is one way of doing it. Mm. But it's interesting, ha having shared this uh, research with, in a number of groups now, the most common response is, yeah, but what, a, like, how, you know, like, are you saying that we can't find ways in which Jesus is being subversive, as if it's an attempt to kind of preclude that discussion? No, not at all. It's just to show that the discussion itself isn't going to get you anywhere politically. Mm. Um, mm. You're going to have to do something different. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. So, yeah, on, on that note, I, I'd like to thank Robert Miles for his willingness to be with us to, to talk about his, um, his article, The Fetish for a Subversive Jesus, which is uh, um, uh, to appear shortly in the Journal for the Study of the Historical Jesus. Um, uh, uh, and um, you may also want to uh, look at the book The Homeless Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, as that's also uh, relevant for, for this study. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Robert.